So here we go, deja vu all over again. And no, I was not planning to do another episode about the SLS this soon. However, NASA has come up with an explanation of what happened during the green run. And lo and behold, it turned out to be something very similar, well, almost exactly actually, to what I thought had happened the day after the incident occurred. As you may recall, the Boeing software showed a major failure on one of the Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-25 engines, and once this major failure started to appear, it shut down the entire test automatically. But I was very suspicious of this, as the RS-25s are extremely reliable engines, and even though these had been modified, they had already gone to space on the space shuttle in the past several times actually so this was my initial reaction uh, personally i don't think this is an aerojet rocketdyne issue i don't think the rs-25s went bad these engines had performed extraordinarily well in space on a number of occasions this is just a personal opinion, and I'm very interested to see if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I think it was a software issue. I don't think there was a problem with the equipment at all, um, but that's just my own personal opinion. All of these... And on January 19th, NASA announced that it was indeed a software issue, although not a software malfunction as it turned out, or that was their eventual story. Instead, they said that it was something that was intentionally conservative, that the software was intentionally sensitive, and so that's why it shut everything down, even though there really wasn't a serious problem. So we were told. Well, I'm going to give you my reaction to that explanation and why that could represent a very serious problem for the future of Artemis and the SLS in just a few moments. Good evening and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. Sort of an unexpected episode of I was planning on releasing one at about this time, but not about this topic. I had talked about Boeing way too recently for me to talk about them again, but the whole green run thing, I just have to talk about it again. Now, as you saw from the intro, I expected that this was going to be a software issue and not any sort of mechanical issue with the RS-25s or anything associated with them. I turned out to be right, not because I have any sort of insight or because I happen to know a lot about this subject, really, compared to your average rocket science scientist rather, as you can see, I can't even say it properly. I'm a complete idiot. And yet I had that figured out before they even announced it. And now they're trying to make it seem as if it was all planned, as if they had set the whole damn thing up as being especially sensitive so that anything that even appeared to be out of sorts, it would shut down the test. Funny that they didn't talk about any of that before the test, during the test, after the test, saying anything about how, oh, you know, we set everything up to be extremely sensitive to make sure that we protect this extremely valuable piece of equipment. So, you know, shutting down early is not something that, you know, we didn't expect. You know, they didn't say anything like that at all. They were completely clueless. But 
They discovered it fairly quickly, obviously, and now they're trying to make it seem as if this is what they had planned all along. I've got one thing to say about that. Bullshit. That felt really good. Let me say that again. Bullshit! So, now that we've determined that this was something that was absolutely planned from the beginning, there's no real need for another test. Or so some people are saying, or so we're starting to hear, that we're going to proceed with Artemis 1 without going through another green run, which would be absolute idiocy. Just like with the Starliner, the moment we detected, or rather NASA, detected one software glitch, they had 80 identified later on, as we're going to talk about later in the video. So I've got some pretty specific recommendations of my own that I'd like to make as to what actually should happen here, and let's get to them right now. So even though this is probably unnecessary for most of you, let's look at what happened with the Starliner and why that led me to believe that this SLS issue was software related. First of all, the vessel failed to achieve the correct orbit because of a software issue. After that, NASA tried to correct the orbit by communicating with the spacecraft, but couldn't because of a software issue. And after that, the service module nearly collided with the crew module because of a software issue. So understandably, NASA demanded that Boeing conduct an in-depth investigation, oh yeah, while NASA was overseeing it, of course. And as most of us know, NASA discovered no less than 80 corrective measures, software-related almost all of them, that Boeing had to undertake in order to make the Starliner safe. And this on a vehicle that was supposedly ready for human transport. Absolutely ridiculous. And it has taken Boeing a year and a half to correct these issues. So, the Starliner is ready for another unmanned test sometime in March. We'll see what happens there. But we've discovered that most of the problems were created because Boeing did not carry out integrated testing of all the systems and all the subcontractors involved in the construction of the Starliner. And the same problem exists with the SLS, which means what happened with the Green Run should be a surprise to nobody. And where you've got one software issue, you probably have a bunch of others, especially when that first software issue manifested itself just a little bit over a minute into the first test. And so the whole idea of sending up Artemis 1 without another test? <laughs> Only a complete lunatic would do something like that. A complete lunatic and NASA, that is. But then again, Artemis 1 is unmanned, so why should we be concerned about it? Well, there's a very good reason for that. Over $18 billion have been invested in this project already. The Artemis 1 rocket alone is going to run about $1 to $2 billion. And if this rocket doesn't have, for example, a main engine cutoff occur at the right time and starts heading off in an entirely different direction and doesn't end up anywhere near the moon, and so we've ended up throwing away $1 to $2 billion worth of taxpayer money on a rocket that got nowhere near its objective, how do you think Congress is going to react to that? In my opinion, the SLS needs a top-to-bottom review of its entire software system, preferably by an outside IT consultant. And after that, it needs integrated testing of all of its systems before we send it on its way to the moon. And yes, this is going to take money, and this is going to take time. But in my opinion, a successful mission that occurs sometime in 2022 or 2023 would be a hell of a lot better than a woeful failure in 2021. Okay, say I'm overreacting here. Well, at the very least, 
NASA needs to carry out a second green run, and the SLS has to show that it's capable of carrying out that green run for the full extent of the burn, the way the green run was supposed to be carried out in the first place without any more software issues. If it can't do that, then it needs that review, but at the very least there needs to be another green run. But that comes with its own problems. You see, every time you carry out a test like the Green Run, it puts stresses on the ship. And this is, after all, the very ship that NASA intends to send to the moon. And so, every time you carry out something like this, you're putting additional stress on a vessel that's eventually going to go to the moon. Do you really want to take those kinds of chances? And that's why, NASA says, the instruments were set to be so sensitive and designed to cut everything out if they saw the first sign of a problem. But here's another issue. Isn't a test like this supposed to push all these systems to their limit to make sure that they can function under the most difficult of circumstances? Well, apparently not according to NASA's current philosophy. And this philosophy, if it actually exists, is fundamentally flawed. You want to push systems to their limit to make certain that they're going to perform under extreme circumstances in space. You don't want to go gentle on them during tests. That's why the RS-25s were running at 109% at the time of shutdown, because they were pushing the engines. And by the way, that's also why I think that the entire explanation of the instruments being set to a very sensitive level to baby the system so to speak and that's why they shut down is a complete load of crap. And in case you're not convinced, look at the test of the Orbital ATK solid rocket boosters. They didn't baby those things at all. They pushed them to their limit and that's what you're supposed to do during a test. And by the way, this solid rocket booster performed flawlessly because it really didn't have any integrated systems to speak of. Orbital ATK pretty much controls everything associated with the solid rocket boosters. Not so with the rest of the ship. And herein lies a serious potential problem. So in order to make sure that we don't need to have a complete review of all the systems, even though I really think we need to anyway, the best solution is to carry out another green run for the full duration of the burn and make certain that there are no other software problems. If there aren't, and by the way, I will be very shocked if that happens, then I think we can proceed with Artemis 1 as planned. But if there are any further problems, then we probably have the Starliner happening all over again, except this time far, far worse, simply because the SLS is a much more sophisticated machine than the Starliner. But integrated testing and a full review of the software would take time and money. Even another green run is going to take time and money. Where is that money going to come from? Congress has approved a lot of extra cash for the SLS, but only for additional SLS rockets not for further development. Does this mean that we're going to build fewer SLS rockets and we're going to have to pay even more in order to complete the Artemis project as it has been planned thus far? Well, I can answer that question with two words. Hell no. Boeing is more than capable of paying for any shortcomings that the SLS may have. Now, Boeing is paying for the corrective actions to the Starliner out of its future earnings from NASA. That is what it intends to charge per seat for every NASA astronaut going up to the ISS on the Starliner in the future. We're not going to have that kind of luxury as far as the SLS is concerned. This needs to come straight out of Boeing's profits, and they have the money to do it. 
And since Boeing is a publicly traded company, it's very easy to prove these facts. Let's have a look at what their Defense, Space, and Security Division, in other words, the division that builds things like the Starliner and the SLS, made in terms of profits in 2018 and 2019. In 2018, Boeing made $1,657,000,000 worth of earnings off of their operations for an operating margin of 6.3%. And in 2019, they made $2,608,000,000 with a 9.9% .9 operating margin, a 57% increase in profits. Let me repeat that for emphasis. After all this ineptitude, Boeing has received a 57% increase in their profit margins, at least for their defense, space, and security divisions who have been doing an awful job as of late. So the solution to this problem is obvious. Boeing needs to pay for another green run at the very least out of their own pocket. And if there's so much as a hiccup with this test, then Boeing needs to pay for a full review of their entire software system together with fully integrated testing of the SLS, which means everything will depend on SpaceX. And I don't like that one little bit. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's a little bit more of a rant, a little bit more along the lines of the sorts of things I did when I first started this channel, and maybe I need to get more back to my roots a little bit, because this is completely unacceptable. What happened in the green run after all of the money that's been spent on this to even consider going forward with Artemis 1 without a very thorough top-to-bottom examination of all of the software, in my opinion, by an outside contractor, absolutely needs to be carried out before we move forward. And it has to be done at Boeing's expense. And if they don't like it, then NASA can do business with somebody else exclusively for the entire future of NASA, no matter how many centuries or decades that may be. That's what we can use to, as far as negotiating power is concerned with Boeing. We have to get Boeing to do what they've been contracted to do. They have the future of Artemis and the future of the manned expedition to the moon, at least to that one location, to our satellite, in their hands. The destiny of NASA and Artemis is under their control, and they need to take responsibility for a change. So... Let's hope they do so, because going forward and trying for a test of Artemis 1 without doing all of these things, a complete examination of all the software and total integrated testing, as they have been very reluctant to do in the past and they absolutely have to do in the future. If they don't do that, Artemis is doomed, in my opinion. And with if Artemis fails, the future of manned exploration is in serious jeopardy because we can't depend exclusively on SpaceX. Anything could happen to Elon Musk. He could die in a plane crash in his private jet. Anything could occur and his vision could be lost forever. We cannot depend exclusively on SpaceX for man's future exploration of the solar system. So until Boeing actually starts taking some ownership for their screw-up, and does something decisive to repair it at their own expense rather than at the American taxpayer's expense, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.